got myself some wisdom from a leather bag book got myself a savior when i took a second pages and what did i find a black and white portrait of a king who's a friend of mine funny how when you think you're right everybody else must be wrong Till someone with fool's wisdom somehow comes along His voice was strange and the words he said I didn't quite understand Yet I knew that he was speaking right by the leather back book in his hand Hey Blessings in Jesus, dear friends. Welcome to Word for the Weekend here on RTN Christian TV in Scotland, going from Scotland to Britain to the world. Thank you so much for joining us. My name, of course, is James Jacob Prash, and we have newer people coming to us all the time. RTN is the leading Christian internet TV platform in Scotland expanding continually globally. We have apps, we have podcasts, we have a number of features on our Facebook page. Please avail yourself of all of our resources. They're there for you, they're there for free, and they're there above all to glorify Jesus. Also, in conjunction with tonight's teaching, I would just like to uh, point people to our latest book, No Bomb in Gilead. What really happens after the rapture? What really takes place after the rapture? No bomb in Gilead. There is so much fanfare about propositions that are simply not scriptural, that the rapture is going to herald the great end time revival and all kinds of other speculations. What does the scripture really say is going to take place after the faithful church is removed and God turns his salvific purposes? primarily back to Israel and the Jews during this dark time. That's the book, No Bomb in Gilead. Uh, it's available on the Moriel website, moriel.org, and on various other outlets. Uh, all proceeds, royalties are donated to the work of Jesus. We make, I make certainly no profit from it, but we want you to be able to profit from it by the grace of God. No Bomb in Gilead. Well, a subject tonight. Our subject tonight is one that we've talked about before, 
but I'd like to look at it from a different aspect. Now, why are we looking at this subject so often? Simply because of its pertinence and relevance to the time in which we live. Many of the people who follow our ministry, both here and on Moriel TV and on Grain Store and various other internet platforms where we are to be found, they would agree with us that the constellation of world events are in a configuration setting the stage for the prophecies of the book of Revelation, Daniel and Ezekiel, and so forth. The prophetic significance of what we see happening in the Middle East, in Europe, the prophetic significance of what we see happening in the evolution of technology, such as artificial intelligence, pushing towards transhumanism, and also biogenetic engineering. Fiat currencies, what's transpiring in the world of economics, geopolitics, the Great Reset. What is really underlying these things? The politicization of pandemics? Where was this going? Well, without being conspiracy theorists and without being alarmists, we want to be biblicists and we want to look at the pathetic significance of these events. As we have always said, this time is different from the other times in history when sincere Christians thought it was the last days. Because this time, Israel has been reconstituted as a nation and the Jews are back in their ancient capital. Those things are essential for the return of Christ to happen. We know this from Matthew 23, 39. We know this from Zechariah 12, 1 to 10. We know this from Luke 21, 24. The Jews must be back in their land and in their capital for Christ to return. And this has not happened before this present generation in time, going back to the rebirth of Israel in 1948 and the Zionist movement. This time is different. And the pace at which things are increasing exponentially are going towards events that will precede and culminate with the return of Jesus. And afterwards, of course, what we write about in No Bomb and Gilead, what takes place after the resurrection and the rescue, the rapture, the harpezo of the faithful church. Again, most of you are familiar with these things and you know our position and the position of those who were broadly in agreement with us. I revisit the subject reluctantly, but I just felt I needed to pray. And I asked our other production team members on RTN to pray and consider, should we address this subject again from a different angle in light of what is happening today? By today, I mean the present time, as in the last few months even. We were in agreement that we should do so. Now, I'd like to preface my remarks by saying I'm not angry at anyone but the devil. I'm here to attack him. I'm not here to attack other brethren in Christ. I may disagree with their doctrine, but I'm not questioning their personal integrity, their motives, their sincerity, their salvation. And I'm not denying that some of the brethren whose positions we're going to review tonight are right about other things, that I appreciate other things that they've done. I would count some of them as personal friends. I've done conference events with most of them, uh, sizable conferences, thousands of people even. Uh, I'm not in any way aiming to defame or to bring into question the standing in Christ of any of these figures. I'm simply dealing with doctrine and praxis. That's all. And I sincerely mean that. May God bless every one of these brethren. And if I am misguided in what I'm saying, may the Lord correct me as well as correct them. We all want to please Jesus and get it right. 
May his spirit guide us into all truth. Again, not to sound like a pounding drum or a broken record. We have been saying many times that as the coming of Christ approaches, the coming of Antichrist also approaches. And as most of you know, our position is, and I have to say these things again for our new listeners, our new viewers, so I'm saying it for a reason. We have new people all the time. We know from our stats who may not be familiar with all of these positions that we stand by. That as the Holy Spirit is preparing the faithful church for the coming of Christ, the spirit of Antichrist is preparing the harlot church and the world's false religious system and the world for the coming of the Antichrist working through the zeitgeist, working through the spirit of the age, working through a number of things, the spirit of Antichrist is preparing the way for the coming of the Antichrist. The same way and in counterfeit of the Holy Spirit who is preparing the faithful Christians for the coming of Jesus. The faithful church and the unfaithful church. And the unfaithful church, the apostate church, is part of the fallen world even though it bears the name of Christ surreptitiously, even fraudulently. How do we put this? Well, we have warned a number of times about very dangerous things that some people have said. By people, I mean Bible-believing Christians, expositors, people who are theologically trained have said things that can mislead and have misled the church. Things being taught in seminaries and Bible colleges where future ministers, future pastors are, are being trained for the ministry are being indoctrinated into wrong views so that when they go into their future pulpits, they will not be able to properly feed the sheep and give the proper food at the proper time. Again, while I find it appalling, I want to acknowledge the many true things that Dr. John MacArthur has said. He has said many true things, many true things. He's done a lot of good things. Now, I know there are controversies at the current moment surrounding his financial integrity. I'm not addressing those things, and I'm not taking sides in that dispute. I'm avoiding it. I'm just looking at some of his teaching. And in addition to his radical cessationism, which I believe to be as wrong on one extreme as hyper-Pentecostalism and ultra-charismaticism are on the other, he has the view that it will be possible to take the mark of the beast and still repent, be saved, and go to heaven. And this is in direct, direct, unambiguous contradiction to Revelation chapter 14, Revelation chapter 16, and Revelation chapter 20, verse 4. The people who take the mark have sold their souls to Satan. There's no salvation for them. But John MacArthur says there can be. The late Jimmy DeYoung said the same thing. This is both false and dangerous. But it's predicated upon the presupposition of a pre-tribulational rapture. We've also warned in the past about those figures who are against studying prophecy who tell people to avoid it, even though Jesus emphatically said, be watchful. Let no one mislead you. Watch for these signs in the Olivet Discourse. Again, <clears throat> at the risk of sounding like the broken record, I speak, of course, of Rick Warren. Avoid end time prophecy. It's a diversion he teaches. Don't listen to what Jesus said about being watchful. Listen to me and ignore what Jesus said. 
don't believe the New Testament, believe the purpose-driven agenda. I'm just quoting him. I'm quoting him. Now, while I have no personal hostility towards John MacArthur, I do have a hostile position to Rick Warren. He's a deceiver. But I digress. Another deceiver is, is Chris Rosebro, the partner of J.D. Hall, who has now been discredited and deposed. But Mr. J.D. Hall's partner, Chris Rosebro, he openly mocks people, openly ridicules belief in a rapture, in the mark of the beast, in an antichrist. People who believe those things are subject of ridicule. He mocks them. We have videos of him mocking belief in the mark of the beast and the antichrist. He just mocks belief in it. In addition, of course, to his four-letter vulgarity. Now, unfortunately, Mr. Rosebro was promoted by various people. He's promoted by Bethel Communications, by Studio Scotland, the men laws, and so forth. Despite his vulgarity and despite his very serious false teaching, <clears throat> uh, he's promoted by Studio Scotland, Bethel Communications. They promote someone like him. Uh, He's a dangerous man. <clears throat> Apart from the scandals and the vulgarity, he's a dangerous man by what he teaches. John MacArthur, we can look at the good things as well as the error, although the error is very serious and very dangerous. Rosebro and Rick Warren and those who promote them have to rather be numbered among the false teachers who Jesus said would come in the last days. They are false teachers raised up by the devil to mislead Christians in the last days. Again, this is only background for our new viewers. Our established viewership are aware of our position concerning the teachings of these men. But Jesus emphasized if possible, even the elect will be deceived. I have no problem warning about a Rosebro or a Menelaus or about a uh, Rick Warren. I have no problem. But what do I do or what do we do when there's people who you often agree with, who you are sure are trying to do the right thing scripturally in the sight of the Lord, who go into something erroneous. John MacArthur being an example, it'll be possible to take the mark of the beast. And it is a false teaching, serious and dangerous. Well, I'd like to look at some clips of some men. I know some of them. I've shared platforms with some of them. Others I only know of, but I know people who know them. Now, as brethren in Christ, these are brethren in Christ. These are not people who are inimical to the cause of Christ. These are not people who are enemies of scriptural truth. These are not people who we should discount as willful deceivers or anything of that nature. They're not like that. They're different. They say and do good things. They love the Lord. They mean well. But if possible, the elect will be deceived. Let's look at two clips. One clip will deal with the subject of well, we have to know who the Antichrist is before the rapture. And the second deals with the subject of imminency. We're looking primarily at three figures initially. Dr. Ron Rhodes, a noted apologist, a man whose work I respect. I know many people who know him, and I have a high view of him. I always have had a high view of him and what he does, Dr. Ron Rhodes. Another gave up the ghost last week, Professor Ed Hinson. Ed Hinson was the Dean Emeritus 
of the Divinity School at Liberty University, and he was a professor of Old Testament and eschatology, training ministers for the for future ministry in the area of eschatology. And you also had a, a noted t- TV show that was unfortunately on TBN. TBN, of course, was saturated in financial and moral scandal and so forth with the word faith money preachers. Nonetheless, he appeared on it. Uh, I'm not wanting to taint him with those people and the, and, and the scandals that took place at, at TBN uh, with the Crouches and so forth. And I don't believe in guilt by association, but I do believe in guilt by cooperation. First uh, Corinthians 5 tells us we should not associate with people who are swindlers. And, and, and it was a con game uh, with the Crouches. It was terrible. The whole word faith money thing is a con game. Yet Ed Henson was on it. He was one of these people who had the attitude or has the attitude that many have that I'll go anywhere. I'll go on any platform. I'll speak with anybody. Uh, Because you get a platform that gives you exposure, if that causes you to be identified with nefarious people, Corinthians says we shouldn't do that, not even to eat with such a one. But he, in effect, disagreed and did it anyway, or he ignored what Corinthians said. This is Dr. Ed Hinson, Professor Ed Hinson. Again, he gave up the ghost last week. I'm sorry for his family. I'm not trying to disrespect them at a time of mourning. I'm just addressing the issues. Uh, And I will tell you this, he was a personally nice person. He was a nice guy. I have no doubt as as to his love of the Lord. Um, I have no question about anything of that nature. Uh, And he's a nice person. He's just a nice person to the extent I knew him, and I knew him reasonably well. He was a nice person. Uh, But he is now not with us. Then there is someone who I also know, not as well as I would like to, but someone I hold in very high regard, Dr. Mark Hitchcock. Mark Hitchcock is a Christian lawyer and theologian. He is a very good debater. He is doctrinally very solid on nearly all issues. And he did a fantastic job in his debate with Hank Canegraaff, who, of course, went off and wrecked havoc with Christian Research Institute and so forth. Nonetheless, we'll come back to that in a moment. The first video clip are these brothers addressing the issue of uh, the Antichrist. We have to know who he is before the rapture. And the second deals with the subject of imminency. Can we play the two clips, please? A couple of questions uh, as we switch hats here. A couple of questions on the Antichrist. Will Christians be able to identify the Antichrist before the rapture? No. I don't think so. I don't think so. I don't think any of us do. I think Second <laughs> Thessalonians 2 pretty much settles that yeah. because, you know, some of the uh, Thessalonians were worried that they might be already in the tribulation or the day of the Lord. And, uh, you know, Paul writes them and he says, I don't know, you know, who told you this, but... You know, the Antichrist has to be on the scene when you're in the day of the Lord. And if you're not seeing the Antichrist yet, you're not in the day of the Lord. And so Paul made that point to them. Now, if you know who the Antichrist is, I I always tell people tongue in cheek that you've been left behind. (laughs) It says in that passage, clearly, the restrainer has to be removed first. And uh, if the restrainer is indeed the Holy Spirit empowering the church and the church goes out in the rapture, the rapture has to take place before the Antichrist can be revealed. Uh, a lot of people misread that passage. Uh, 2 Thessalonians 2 is a very important passage about the timing of when the Antichrist himself will be revealed. Uh, the scripture actually uses the same word apocalypse there uh, that it does for the revelation of Jesus Christ. You'll have a revelation of the Antichrist, but only after the restrainer's been removed. 
Yeah, the, the Bible tells us there, I think, in that passage that you know he's being uh, he's being restrained. That, that Satan can't bring his man on the scene right now. The Holy Spirit's restraining him. But I think that's interesting because that means, I believe, that Satan probably has someone ready in every generation to be the Antichrist. There's always an Antichrist that's alive somewhere on the earth. And, but, but that person will only be revealed as the Antichrist after the rapture takes place. So trying to figure out you know, if someone's name equals 666 or all those kind of things, to me that's jumping the gun. Uh, we're, that's working ahead of time. Uh, we have to wait. Whenever the rapture takes place, those who are on earth then who come to faith in the Lord, they'll be able to calculate and determine who the Antichrist is. And one of the reasons why that's necessary, John, is that Satan is not omniscient. He doesn't know omnisciently the exact timing of the unfolding of prophetic events. And so, therefore, it is necessary for him to have a man waiting in the wings in every generation. Yeah, so it shouldn't surprise us there was a Hitler and a Stalin and people like that who could have easily become that person, uh, but weren't. Satan has to read the Bible, read the newspaper. He's brilliant and intelligent, but he is not God, and he does not have omniscience. He doesn't even know the timing of the rapture. Uh, and so he has to wait. His hands are tied by the sovereignty of God. Only when the trumpet sounds and the archangel shouts and the bride of Christ is taken out, only then will he be free to indwell and empower someone to be the Antichrist. Absolutely. Second question, okay? We've done this series on Revelation, and you fellows have talked about the rapture could happen any moment. People want to know, how do you know that it could happen any moment, and what's this word mean that you've used a couple times called imminent? Where do you have a Bible basis for talking about the rapture could happen at any time? Well, in Paul's letter to the Corinthians, he talks about this and says, in a moment, in a flash, in a twinkling of an eye. So something related to the coming of Christ has to happen quickly, suddenly, instantly. And throughout the book of Revelation, seven times you have that phrase, I'll come quickly, I'll come quickly. It's as though he comes and snatches away the church, and that could potentially happen at any moment. Well, when we use the word imminent, we're not meaning that it's immediate necessarily. What we're saying is there's nothing else that has to happen before the rapture takes place. So uh, the rapture is an event that is certain to take place, but it's uncertain when it will happen. It, uh, it's kind of like uh, the big one that everyone's waiting for out in California, you know, this big earthquake that's going to come. Everybody knows it's coming, but no one knows when it's going to happen. So it's an imminent event. It's an event that can take place at any time. And this is really borne out in the Scriptures in 1 Thessalonians 1, 9 and 10. Uh, Paul is writing to the church at Thessalonica. And he says, You turned uh, to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for His Son from heaven who delivers us uh, from the wrath to come. And uh, the, the word that's used there, to wait, literally means to wait up for. Uh, we're to wait up for His Son from heaven. And if you're waiting up for someone, then the idea is that they could come at any point in time. And it says there too that He's coming to deliver us from this coming wrath, from this time of wrath that's coming in the tribulation. So this also supports the idea that His coming will be before uh, this time of wrath that's coming on the earth. Yeah. I think also um, in Revelation 3.10, it talks about how the church will be delivered from the hour of trial that is to come. I want you to understand that it's the time period that we are to be delivered from, not just tribulation. It's not as if God is going to sustain us through a period of tribulation, but rather the church will be kept out of the period of tri tribulation. It's the Greek word ek, which means out of. So the church will be kept out of the period of tribulation. And John, this is distinct from general tribulation. All of us as Christians experience general tribulation. Life is tough sometimes, but that's distinct from this period of tribulation that's coming on the earth. And all the verses that deal with the rapture talk about how we're going to be delivered from that time before it even begins. Well, I'm not looking to get the daggers out. Again, these are people who I otherwise respect and personally like. They appeared on the John Ankerberg show, a major Christian TV 
production in North America. I have only ever spoken to John Ankenberg by telephone. I don't really know him except for one or two telephone conversations, but I intimately knew his co-writer, his co-author who wrote his books with him, Dr. John Weldon. Dr. John Weldon was one of my closest friends uh, who, who I knew extremely well. He was my connection indirectly with, with John Ankenberg. Again, another good man. John Ankenberg was a good man. Uh, here lies my problem. I can talk about Rosebro, or I can talk about Rick Warren, or I can talk about all kinds of deceivers and false teachers and those who promote them. I can talk about people like that, the men laws who promote these. I can talk about J.D. Hall. There's no problem. These are false brothers. No problem. But Ron Rhodes, Ed Hinson, Mark Hitchcock, Dr. Ron Rhodes, Dr. Ed Hinson, Dr. Mark Hitchcock, these are men of God. These are brothers. Not easy to be critical of them. Not easy. It's difficult to be critical of people who you like and respect and, and, and generally appreciate otherwise. But I've said that enough times. Let's begin looking at Dr. Ed Hinson. Again, our condolences to his family. He was a nice man. And I uh, think he shall be sadly missed by those who knew him and, and, and loved him and liked him. And, and I liked him. Let's understand something about Dr. Ed Hinson. Dr. Ed Hinson is the, or had been up until last week, the Dean Emeritus of the Divinity School of Liberty University, where he was again a professor. Liberty University, of course, has over the last few years been seriously buried in public scandal and lawsuits are flying, believers suing each other. It has become very, very ugly and unfortunate that this is taking place at the premier evangelical institution of higher learning in the East Coast of the United States, if not the USA generally. Uh, it's very unfortunate what's happened there. These, these scandals and the money things, and it's very unfortunate. Uh, I hope the Lord can straighten it out. But we're talking about the teaching of Ed Hinson, which is foundational to the eschatology of that institution. Now, these brothers, Ron Rhodes, Ed Hinson, Mark Hitchcock, they are members along with people like Thomas Ice and uh, David Hawking, another friend, a brother who I love, uh, of the Pre-Trib Research Institute that at least prior to COVID, were having annual conferences in, in uh, Dallas, Texas. And a lot of people who, who, again, I like and appreciate and who do good work and who I usually agree with were members or attendees at this conference. Dr. Arnold Fruchtenbaum being among them, certainly uh, David Hawking. These are good people. But the Institute was founded by another man who I knew, and personally liked, uh, Dr. Tim LaHaye. Tim LaHaye and myself have shared platforms various times. We've done speaking engagements together. I knew him. He's with the with the Lord now, but uh, and his wife Bev. Uh, again, not a man I speak critically of in any personal sense of the word. <clears throat> Another nice guy, and they were in this pre-trib research center. Now, among premillennial evangelical Christians, for want of a better term, these men constitute the mainstay of their doctrinal theology concerning what we call eschatology, the return of Christ, end time events, and so forth, and the rapture, and the rapture. These are the mainstream. These are the acknowledged, quote-unquote, evangelical experts. You don't like to go against experts, but that's what we're doing. 
at least on this issue. On other issues, I'd be very much on the same page with all of them. But this issue, what they said about the Antichrist. Mark Hitchcock rightly pointed out there will be many Antichrists. Satan will have one all the time. Well, the New Testament says there are many Antichrists. This is very, very true. We deal with this in the book I authored, Shadows of the Beast, again, also available on the Moria website and through other outlets. But let's understand what they are saying here. Ed Hinson was not concerned about the Antichrist. It's not going to concern us. Well, there are many Antichrists, and they didn't concern him. Remember, he was the dean emeritus of the Divinity School at Liberty University, where he was a professor. Let's look at the people who have been invited to address the student body in the chapel services at Liberty University. Please watch this clip. That can keep God from keeping his covenant with me. I'm not in covenant with a person. I'm not in covenant with a political party. I'm in covenant with God Almighty. I am God Almighty. Get that off you. That's not your name. That's not your station. That's not your end. It's in me. It's in me. It's in me. It is God that worketh in you. Liberty University has hosted a number of speakers who are antichrists. Sun Young Moon, the Korean cult leader, founder of the Unification Church, who's now dead, convicted criminal, imprisoned in federal prison. We have people in Moriel who had been members of his cult who got saved out of it. I know a number of former ex quote unquote Moonies. I knew one of his bodyguards, a, a, a Jewish martial artist named Jeff Brodsky, was one of Reverend Moon's bodyguards. It is a cult based on money and unbelievable teaching in a book called The Divine Principle. He maintained that Jesus Christ failed in his mission. So Moon is the return of Christ. He is the Lord of the second advent. He has returned to succeed where Jesus failed. In the book, The Divine Principle, he openly states and has proclaimed verbally to his followers that he is the Lord of the second advent. He is the return of Jesus Christ. That is what Moon said. Why did the late Jerry Falwell, who mustered political support among believers for Ronald Reagan, 
Why did Jerry Falwell bring Moon to Liberty University to address the student body in the chapel and embrace him, a convicted felon and a cult leader who says he's the return of Christ, and celebrate him as an unsung hero? Not only that, but major funding came to Liberty University from Moon's cult. Now, fair enough, the ravens fed Elijah. God can give his work money from anywhere. However, you don't bring in an antichrist, the man who says he's the return of Jesus. Bring him on a platform before the Christian student body of people studying for the ministry and laud him, laud him as an unsung hero. When Moon was in prison, Tim LaHaye was actively involved in protesting his conviction and trying to get him out of federal prison. Tim LaHaye was trying to get a man who says he's the return of Christ out of prison. Falwell brings him in. This is a literal antichrist. A man who's in place of Christ, a literal antichrist. Addressing the students at Liberty and the trustees and the faculty and the deans, including Professor Ed Hinson, said and did nothing. Nothing. He said he's the return of Christ and you're calling him a hero and celebrating him? at an evangelical institution, supposedly? But Ed Hinson went along with it the same as the rest of them. I'm not surprised at the scandals that have overtaken that place. So because Ed Hinson does not believe you have to worry about identifying the Antichrist before Christ comes, he's willing to go along with an antichrist speaking at Liberty University. But Moon was not the only antichrist they had speaking at Liberty University. Look at Stephen Furtick. I am God Almighty. That's what he said. There is only one man who can say he is God Almighty, and that is Jesus Christ, because he truly is God Almighty. Nobody else. Not Stephen Furtick. But they brought him to liberty. And among others, and I'm not singling him out, Professor Ed Hinson said and did nothing. These are open antichrists. Now notice the relationship between wrong doctrine and wrong praxis because Ed Hinson said we don't have to worry about identifying the antichrist. He let obvious antichrists speak at liberty and said nothing. Let's look at some of the other people who spoke at liberty. Well, if there is a false religion, a cult that is antichrist, it is certainly Mormonism. They have a pseudologon, a false word of God called the Book of Mormon and various other writings they hold to be canonical. Mormonism teaches that Jesus Christ is the spirit brother of Satan. Jesus is the spirit brother of Satan? That is the teaching of Mormonism. Yet here's Mick Romney invited to speak at liberty. A man who holds and disseminates those beliefs. 
open antichrist. But again, Professor Ed Hinson had no problem with it. Notice his wrong doctrine, his erroneous doctrine resulted in wrong behavior. He should have objected, protested, resigned if necessary. But there were others, other luminaries, who perhaps did not claim to be God Almighty or Christ, or did not believe that Jesus is the spirit brother of Satan, but they brought public disgrace to the church. I think of Carl Lynn, the disgraced former pastor of Hillsong in New York, in his TV interview when he wouldn't say homosexuality is wrong, when they had the Hillsong Women's Conference with pyrotechnics and a Jesus coming out dressed in female drag as the Statue of Liberty, with the Statue of Liberty crown instead of the crown of thorns. And then they brought out, there's over 2,000 Christian women at their worship session. They called this their worship session. They brought out the naked cowboy, some guy with cowboy boots, a big American cowboy hat, and a guitar. That's it, the naked cowboy. He's on the stage leading the worship, or what they called worship, at Hillsong. Got in all the newspapers. This is Stephen Furtick. This is Carl Lynn. And bring him into liberty. Of course, Lynn was found in financial impropriety and in moral scandal, and he's out. So was his boss invited to speak at liberty, Brian Houston, who protected his pedophile bisexual father, Frank, found guilty of doing so by the Royal Commission and is now on trial in Australia, and who has since also been found in gross immoral conduct. I recall speaking on the radio in, in Sydney, Australia, and I was challenging Brian Houston's book, You Need More Money. It's unbelievable what was in that book. It was all motivational psychology oriented towards money, which he was presenting as Christianity. the con game but they have him at liberty they had John Hagee I appreciate John Hagee's support for Israel I really do but apart from the moral questions about his divorce and remarriage with the scriptural grounds he's dual covenant theology he says that Jesus Christ never claimed to be the Messiah. Therefore, we can't hold Jews responsible for not accepting him. He teaches that. No, Jesus did claim to be the Messiah. And Jews who reject their own Messiah are eternally lost. My family are Israeli Jews, my wife, my children. Jews need to be saved. They need to know about Yeshua. But they had him. at liberty, and Ed Hinson said nothing. They had Francis Chan, the mystic leader of the Lectio Divina. They had all kinds of crazy people. People who were found implicated in moral scandals, people teaching heresy, mystics, Gnostics. But above all, out and out antichrist somebody who claimed to be the return of Christ. Lauded and celebrated as an unsung hero. Somebody who said, I am God Almighty. Now, I don't believe Ed Hinson personally believed or agreed with any of that. But why didn't he speak out or say something? Well, obviously, a part of the reason he went along with it is 
he didn't think we had to be concerned about the Antichrist. That's something that happens after the rapture, so we can have these Antichrists come in and address the students. That is the Dean Emeritus of the School of Divinity. That is a man responsible for the education of future ministers. Look, without wanting to hit the man, I have to hit what he believed and what he did. Then he goes on to say another myth. Bad exegesis. Reading something into the text that's not there, exegesis. In his mishandling of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Even John MacArthur didn't subscribe to this error. John MacArthur rightly pointed out that the Greek does not say the restrainer, the catacomb will be taken. It simply says the catacomb will stop restraining. John MacArthur was right in his exegesis. The text only says the catacomb will stop restraining. It doesn't say the catacomb will be taken. But Mr. Hinson gave himself license, as these people do, to say the catacomb is the Holy Spirit, and I agree with them. It is. But he's taken. It doesn't say he's taken. Just that he stops restraining. And then when he's taken, the church goes with him. And only then can the Antichrist be empowered by Satan. Not a word of that is found in Scripture. The catacomb is not taken. He just stops restraining. The apostles were here physically. The 120 in the upper room were here before the day of Pentecost, before the Holy Spirit was outpoured. He indwelled their hearts. Jesus breathed on them, but the Holy Spirit had not been poured out on the church. It did not, he did not unite and empower the church and bring the conviction of sin and so forth to the lost. But the apostles were here. The Holy Spirit was in their heart, but he was not operating. That's all it says. That the Captain Cone will stop restraining. Touche John Magatha. You called that one right? That's what it says in Greek. But to read into the text, well, if it stops restraining, it must be taken away. And if the Holy Spirit's taken away, the church must go with it. He's reading into the text, or he read into the text, things the text simply does not say. Then he goes on and he plays the same game most of them do. He begins equating things that are quite different in the original languages. This was Ed Hinson at Liberty University, at Liberty Divinity School, a place that has given platform multiple times to self-professed antichrists. How can an institution like that teach people the truth or prepare ministers to prepare the body of Christ for the return of Jesus? How? How can they possibly equip people for the ministry when they're giving platform to antichrists and promoting them? Embracing them, celebrating them. This is wrong. Now I'd point out further 
there's Dr. Thomas Ice, another person I know. Thomas Ice and someone called Wayne House wrote an excellent book. The best book ever written, Refuting Dominion Theology, that I've ever read was written by primarily Dr. Thomas Ice in association with Dr. Wayne House. Dr. Wayne House was the one who exposed Yale Ripplinger as a charlatan, by the way. Again, these are good men in many ways. Thomas Ice was sponsored by Tim LaHaye. Tim LaHaye was his, his, his ministry sponsor, sort of. Yet Tim LaHaye was defending Moon. Defending the man who says he's the return of Jesus. Thomas Ice didn't say anything. He had no problem with it. No, we're not worried about an antichrist. We can have, ant there are many antichrists. It's okay. We can be with antichrists. We can share platforms with them. and We can try to get them out of prison. We can tell people they're heroes. Invite them to address our student bodies, our seminarians, our future ministers. How do they justify this? There is a relationship between their wrong doctrine and their wrong praxis. What they do is wrong because what they believe is wrong. Let's talk about Dr. Ron Rhodes. Dr. Ron Rhodes' mentor had been a tremendous man of God to whom many of us are indebted. I certainly am. The author of Kingdom of the Cults. You will not find a more outstanding apologist the Christian faith than the author of that book, Dr. Walter Martin. However, Dr. Walter Martin, the mentor of Ron Rhodes, did not believe in a pre-tribulation rapture. His mentor didn't believe it. He believes it. His mentor did not. Now, it is unfortunate that many nefarious figures, wolves in sheep's clothing, permeated the Christian Research Institute. Devious men, one of which was the late Robert Morey, a complete charlatan, and among a lot of other things. But another was Hank Hanegraaff, who became viciously anti-Israel and then entered the Greek Orthodox Church. He got control of Walter Martin's ministry. Horrible to take such a dynamic and important ministry that made the mold, that set the standard. It was the gold standard for discernment and for cult evangelism and apologetics to, to cult people, people in cults, to be taken over by a man like Ken Canagraf. It had been my lament that the leadership of that organization did not go to Ron Rhodes. I think that if that organization, founded by Walter Martin, or under Walter Martin, founded by the Lord, if it had been passed into the leadership of Ron Rhodes, the terrible disasters and scandals that have happened since would not have taken place. I think Ron Rhodes should have been the heir to Dr. Walter Martin in terms of the leadership of that ministry. I have a high view of Ron Rhodes. Most of his apologetics mirror my own to a T. I'm only sorry that Hank Hanegraaff got it instead of Ron Rhodes. No, Dr. Ron Rhodes is a good man. 
But why does he give himself license to equate the tribulation with the day of the Lord? As we have said innumerable times, Orge, God's wrath, Philipsis, tribulation. Mega the lipson, great tribulation. Perezmos, testing. In Hebrew Old Testament, Tzorot, tribulations. Haron, wrath. In Greek and in Hebrew, we have distinct terms for all of these things. They are not interchangeable. They are not synonymous. When the scripture says wrath, it means wrath. We are not appointed unto wrath. The wrath of God is what takes place in the day of the Lord. After the faithful church is removed, comes his wrath. On what basis can you equate the great tribulation with wrath? None. They're used differently in different contexts. Quite differently. How can Dr. Rhodes equate the two? Let's look, if you will, to Matthew 24, the Oliver Discourse. But immediately in verse 29, after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light, fulfilling the prophecies of Joel, chapter 2. The stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky and then the tribes of the earth shall mourn. This is Revelation. Revelation 1 7 and Zechariah 12 10. And they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds in great glory, and he will send forth his angels with a great trumpet, and they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of the sky to the other. That's what it says. That's plainly what it says. Well, it says after the tribulation, the Lord is coming. After the great tribulation. So they buy into this invention of the 19th century, although it had earlier roots of John Nelson Darby. We've explained this before. John Nelson Darby took on the hermeneutics, the biblical interpretation approach of the ancient heretics, the Marcionites. He did not have their Christology. He didn't believe what they believed about Jesus, but he mishandled the scriptures the way they did with this radical distinction between the Old Testament and the New except that he even took it further. Darby and the cult that follows him now is the exclusive brethren in Britain and other countries. John Darby, as you know, if you follow our ministry, said the epistle of James is not for Christians. It's written for unbelieving Jews, for Israel. And the Sermon on the Mount is not for Christians. It's for unsaved Jews. Now, if you were to ask someone like Ron Rhodes, do you believe the epistle of James is not for Christians? Or do you believe the 
Sermon on the Mount is not for Christians, but only for unbelieving Jews. I can't speak for him, but I think Dr. Rhodes would say no. Yet taking that same hermeneutic from Darby, oh, the Sermon on the Mount is not for Christians, James is not for Christians, and Matthew 24, the Olivet Discourse, is not for Christians, it's for unsaved Jews. Well, Hank Canagraph, unfortunately, Hank Canagraph is somebody I met in Hawaii and did not like from the outset. Got control of that ministry. I only wish he didn't. In my opinion, and I told this to Walter Martin's family, it should have gone to Ron Rose. This is a man who I generally like. But Ron Rhodes didn't get it. Hank Hanegraaff did. And when Hank began teaching his false teaching about the book of Revelation and the date of its authorship, he was debated by Mark Hitchcock, the third figure of this panel, this trio. Mark Hitchcock did an excellent job, both theologically and in his argumentation, undoubtedly drawing on his legal skills. He made mincemeat out of Hank Hanegraaff, and I'm glad he did. He gave a superb performance. I believe the Lord was with him to redress and confront the error being taught by Hank Hanegraaff. Mark, Dr. Mark Hitchcock, lawyer, theologian, did a great job. He really did. In the debate... Mark Hitchcock correctly, rightly cited the historical source, Irenaeus. There are other pre Nicene patristic sources worth consulting. Papias, Hagesippus, Justin Martyr. But most important is Irenaeus. Irenaeus got his doctrine from the Apostle John via Polycarp. Polycarp knew John. Irenaeus is indispensable for a number of reasons. And Mark Hitchcock was completely right to cite Irenaeus as a historical source that John was the author of the book of Revelation. God kept him alive to a very old age to write that book at the end of the first century, during the persecution of the Domitian. Great debate. Great presentation and rebuttal and refutation of Hank Hanegraaff by Mark Hitchcock. And a very wise and appropriate citation of Irenaeus. But when you read that same Irenaeus, you do not find that Irenaeus taught the pre-trib rapture or that the Apostle John taught a pre-tribulational rapture. The early Christians did not believe this, despite the efforts of some pre-trib people to do monkey tricks to some of their statements. It was not believed by the early church, at least not the ones who knew the apostles, or who got their doctrine from the apostles, or from those who did get their doctrine from the apostles. So we have Ron Rhodes. He equates things without reference to the fact that in the Greek language there are different words used in different contexts. The day of the Lord is one thing. Great tribulation is one thing. Day of his wrath is one thing. Hour of testing is one thing. Where does he get the basis to equate them? 
We're not appointed unto wrath. The wrath happens after the rapture. But you can't say that the wrath is the full seven years. It is only that portion of that seven years that follows the removal of the faithful church. At the end of the great tribulation, it goes into wrath. When the church is removed, you go from the great tribulation to wrath. Beginning of birth pangs, tribulation, great tribulation, wrath, but the church is removed from this. These are those who have come out of the great tribulation, it says in Revelation 7. Oh, that's the tribulation saints. That's the people who get saved after the rapture. It doesn't say that. You're reading into it something it doesn't say. But let's understand this. They like to cite or quote what Jesus told the Church of Philadelphia from the book of Revelation. Turn with me, please, to the book of Revelation, chapter 3. Verse 10, because you've kept the word of my perseverance, I also will keep you from the hour of testing, that hour which is about to come upon the whole world. Test those, test those who dwell upon the earth. That word there is not wrath or gay, and the word there is not tribulation or great tribulation, Ellipsis or mega ellipso. That word is paresmos. First of all, it is a promise to a specific church in the first century. Now, many dispensationalists, and I agree with them, these seven churches in the first century prefigure seven eras of church history going forward to the return of Christ. Laodicea being the last one. I agree. But it doesn't say it's for the church at large. It says it's for Philadelphia, or at least those Christians in the character of Philadelphia. It's not given to Laodicea, the last church. That's a problem in itself. They're taking something that is specific for a specific church, and they're making it uniform for all churches, all Christians. That's not the context. But then what else do they do? Well, not only does orge equal the ellipsis, but orge and the ellipsis equal paresmos. All three words mean the same thing. Breeze, wind, and gust. <laughs> no, they don't. The hour of testing will be something very, very specific. In Revelation chapter 13, we read this. Once the image of the beast is established in Revelation 13, It was given to him in verse 15 to give breath to the image. Now that means animation. Like God breathed on man, he became a living soul. Many people speculate, but with some reason, that transhumanism is going in this direction. That the image of the beast might even speak and cause as many as do not worship the image of the beast to be killed. And he causes all, the small, the great, the rich and poor, and the free and the slaves to be given the mark on their right hand or on their forehead. And again, we see technology moving in that direction. Already there's implantations of debit cards in Sweden that are subcutaneous on the right hand. Okay. Okay. 
I believe that's the hour of testing. We will get to a point when the abomination is set up in the temple and the Antichrist is identified, confirmed with 666. That is the sign of imminency, which I'll return to in a moment. That is the hour of testing. You either worship the Antichrist, sell your soul to him, take the mark, or die. Now, there'll be a treaty with Israel and maybe some kind of an exemption for Jews up to a point and things like this. We speculate about that, or we can even debate about that. But you either sell your soul to me or you can't buy or sell. John MacArthur says, no, you can take the mark, sell your soul to Satan, and still be forgiven and born again. He says that's not the unforgivable sin of blaspheming the Holy Spirit. Well, he may be right. It isn't. Well, he is right. It, that's, that's not the, all the unforgivable sin. But you're still left with the fact of what it says in Revelation 14, 16, and 20. Let's look at it. The smoke of their torment in verse 11 goes up, and now Tao and Yones, as you heard me say, they have no rest day and night, those who worship the beast in his image, and whoever receives the mark of his name. That's the perseverance of the saints, the one who are willing to die rather than take it, Revelation chapter 20. I saw the thrones in verse 4, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given to them. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of the testimony of Jesus and because of the word of God. And those who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received the mark upon their forehead and upon their hand, and they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life, for the thousand years were over. If people could be born again after they took the mark, they would have come to life and co reign with Christ, wouldn't they? But they don't. Those who take the mark don't. John MacArthur is dead wrong. But notice this thing with the mark immediately follows the image of the beast being set up in the temple and end the identification with 666. There'll be many antichrists. But when those two things happen, you know the return of the Lord has become imminent. Look with me, please, once again to Matthew chapter 24. Therefore, verse 15, when you see the abomination of desolations, the shikuts of Meshomem from Daniel, spoken of through Daniel, standing in the holy place, that'll be the tribulational temple, but there is a deeper meaning to it. He will be worshipped in the apostate church. Let those who are in the field flee to the mountains, etc., etc., etc. There will be a flight. Then there will be a harvest. Lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west. So shall be the coming of the Son of Man. It is when the image is set up in the temple and the ultimate Antichrist is conclusively identified with 666, the number of the beast is known, be it Gematria, Isopsophia, or otherwise, that we know the return of the Lord is imminent. Fasten your seatbelt. 
That's what it says. Dr. Hitchcock, and I say this with respect, he says, this is about the tribulation saints who come to faith after the rapture. On what basis? It doesn't say that. Oh, because we're not appointed unto wrath. It's not the wrath. It's the tribulation. We're saved out of here before the wrath. Oh, but the hour of testing. That's right. We're out of here before this happens. At least the faithful churches. Those in the character of Philadelphia. It's the hour of testing. Then they go on to this idea of imminency. Nothing has to happen. Good heavens. Bear with me, please. I'm reading from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Now concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our assembling to meet him, okay? Erotomen de omas adelphoi. Hupertes parousias, parousia, tokoria of the Lord, Jesu Christi of Jesus, kai amon Epi sunagage ep aton. Epi sunagage, epe around synagogue, get towards synagogue, are gathering together to be with him. So it's talking about the rapture and the resurrection. We meet the Lord in the air. This is indisputable. Now, these people were afraid that they had missed the rapture. So Paul goes on to assure them of something. He says in verse 3, let no one in any way deceive you. For that day will not come unless the apostasy, apostasia, comes first. Proton kai apocalypso ho anthropon tes enomos. And until the revelation of the man of lawlessness. Dr. Rhodes goes into this. Now I'm sure Dr. Rhodes knows Greek as well as I do. Maybe better, I don't know. I, just, I can speak Hebrew, but Greek, I only ever learned how to read it. And to analyze some of the grammar and so on. But I'm sure he, he is literate in Greek. Let's look at it. Well, it's the autumn. A few weeks ago, it was still summer. We could go swimming. It was 85 degrees. Have you noticed how the temperatures have gone down? Now it's only 70 degrees. And at night, it's cool at 60 degrees. I hope it doesn't snow. And someone says in response, don't worry. It can't snow until it gets colder. It's got to be freezing temperature, zero centigrade Celsius, 32 Fahrenheit, or the snow won't survive. It's got to get colder. It's got to go down to freezing temperature to get the snow. Don't worry. Snow's not coming until the temperature reaches the freezing point atmospherically or the, or the water, temperature of water. 
Ooh. Six weeks later. Well, the thermometer went down to 32 degrees, zero degrees centigrade. It must be snowing. Well, you can say if it's snowing, the temperature must have gone down to freezing point. But you cannot say because the temperature is freezing point, it is snowing. That is illogical. Dr. Rose says exactly that. The Antichrist can't come. Don't worry. Until certain things happen. And when he comes, we're going to be in a situation where if he's here, it means the rapture already happened. So the rapture has to happen before the Antichrist comes. If the Antichrist has come, it means the rapture has happened. Because it's 32 degrees Fahrenheit, zero Celsius, does not mean it's snowing. It only means it's possible for it to snow. When the temperature was warmer, it couldn't snow. Now it can snow, but it doesn't prove it's snowing. Because the Antichrist is revealed, that does not prove the rapture has happened. It only proves the rapture, the parousia, the episunagage can happen. Now that we know who he is, it can happen. But that doesn't mean it happened already. No, it cannot snow until it's 32 degrees Fahrenheit, zero centigrade. Because it's zero centigrade does not mean it's snowing. Because we know who the Antichrist is does not mean the rapture already happened. It is a convoluted, irrational, unscriptural argument. Yes, it must be freezing point for it to snow. But because it's freezing point, that doesn't mean it has snowed. The Antichrist must be identified to the faithful church before the rapture. But because he's been identified does not mean the rapture has happened already. Again, reading into the text things, it just does not say imminency in 1 Thessalonians 1, 9 and 10 it is quoted correctly that the Lord will deliver us from the wrath to come Paul says we are not appointed unto wrath this is true But that doesn't mean we have to be raptured before the seven years. When the rapture is not, when the rapture happens during the seven years, the seven years is not the wrath of God. The wrath of God is what happens after the rapture. It's part of the seven years. It's the final half of the seven year or final section of the seven years. The rapture is not at the halfway point, but shortly after. The rapture is between the sixth and seventh seals, but we're not talking about that tonight. 
Revelation is between the sixth and seventh seals. Then comes the wrath of God with the final trumpet. We deal with this in the book, No Bomb in Gilead. What a situation. Imminency. Let's see what the Bible says about imminency. Now, Dr. Hitchcock has been right about a couple of things. One, where he says from 1 Thessalonians, the idea of weight, it's weight up. That is like the bride in the Song of Solomon waiting up for the bridegroom to come, or like the wise virgins. He's, he's, he's completely correct, completely. But there's also something else I must affirm concerning him where he is absolutely correct. I go back again to the Greek text of 2 Thessalonians. In verse 3, unless the apostasia, the apostasy, comes first. Now, that word is not what we call hapex legemini. In other words, it doesn't only occur one place in the Bible. The co-text, that is to say, the other passage that Paul writes about it in the same vein is found in 1 Timothy chapter 4. Uses the same term. The Spirit explicitly in verse 1 says, in the latter times, some will fall away, apostatize from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. People will fall away, depart from the truth under demonic influence, going into false doctrine. People who once professed to believe the truth will be demonically seduced and led into false doctrine, apostasy. The context of 2 Thessalonians 2, the same thing. The Lord will send a deluding influence to make them believe what is false. In judgment, they'll believe false things. This is apostasy. Paul uses the same term. Only a case variation, the same term in two passages talking about the same thing, the close of the age. In Timothy, it means to depart from the truth. And as Dr. Mark Hitchcock says, it means to depart from the truth also in Second Thessalonians. Mark Hitchcock is right. Mark Hitchcock says it cannot mean the rapture. If it meant the rapture, the word would be harpezo in 2 Thessalonians. The word apostasy would be harpezo if it meant the rapture, says Mark Hitchcock. And he's right. Why do I point this out? Because Thomas Ice, because Tim LaHaye and his followers, because a lot of other people are now saying apostasy is not apostasy, it is rapture. Because the underlying Greek term or an underlying Greek term, aphestiomai, which does not even occur in the text. The term aphestiomai is not even in the Greek text of 2 Thessalonians. But because it's an underlying term having the same root as apostasy, an aphestiomai can mean 
a spatial departure. Therefore, Second Thessalonians is saying, it'll not happen until the rapture comes first. Huh? This is insane. But what's really insane is people who are otherwise exegetically credible have bought into it. Mark Hitchcock has, to his credit, not. Let no one deceive you. It, the Episunagage, are gathering together to be with the Lord will not happen until the rapture happens first? Does that make sense? And the man of lawlessness is revealed. He can't be revealed until the rapture happens. He'll have to. It doesn't say that. The word FSDMI is not there. It's apostasia. Same word used in a parallel context by Paul in 1 Timothy 4. And I do pay tribute to Mark Hitchcock for standing up in the pre-trib conference and saying so. You see, these people are becoming divided among themselves as that ship, the pre-trib, sinks. People see something is happening. The Holy Spirit is showing more and more Christians that pre-trib is nonsense. Well, what about this imminency? They say imminency means nothing has to happen. Well, right away, these people have a problem. Because... All of them, all of them would acknowledge the prophetic significance of the rebirth of Israel. All of them would acknowledge that the regathering of the Jews to their biblical homeland and to Jerusalem is of prophetic significance. And when you put that together, the look upon him who they have pierced and so forth and so forth. They've got a problem. But that's not their only problem. What does the Bible mean by the doctrine of imminency that the Lord can come at any time with no signs? I know what they say it means. They say it means the rapture can happen without having to know who the Antichrist is, even though a plain reading of the Greek and English text says the opposite. It can't mean what it seems to say, so it must mean something else, reductio ad absurdum. But let's look to Luke twelve sixteen. He told them a parable. The land of a certain rich man was very productive. And he began reasoning to himself, saying, what shall I do since I have no place to store my crops? And he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, you have many goods laid up for many years to come. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night, your soul is required of you. And now, who will own what you have prepared? This alludes back to what it says in the book of Ecclesiastes, of course. You leave your wealth for others. So is the man who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God.
The doctrine of imminency is this. The Lord can come at any moment, at any millisecond for any one of us. He can come for me. He can come for you. And we need to live our lives as Christians accordingly. Nothing has to happen for Jesus to come back for me or to come back for you. That is the doctrine of imminency. But when you say the rapture, nothing has to happen. Yes, it does. The man of lawlessness must be revealed. Now, these men are the experts. They have said, done, and written many true things. They have accomplished many good things. These are not our opponents. These are not men who are otherwise false teachers. They're not like Rosebro or Menlaws or, or, or Warren or William B. Young. They're not people like that. They're not heretics. There's something different. They're our brethren. Some of them are my friends. I wish I could just keep it to the level of a private disagreement among friends. But when Satan is preparing the way and setting the stage for the arrival of Antichrist, trying to deceive the elect. He's already got the world. He's already got the apostate church. And he already has unbelieving Israel deceived. He's got them in his pocket. He's coming after us, after me, after you, after my fellowship, after your fellowship, after my family, after your family. He's coming after us. He already has the others deceived. And our leaders, our academics, our scholars, our theological experts on doctrine are making Greek words that are not synonyms, synonyms? Reading things into the text that doesn't say instead of exegesis, engaging in exegesis? Don't worry about the Antichrist. Therefore, we'll have one on the stage and call him an unsung hero. Moon says he's the return of Christ. Stephen Furtick says he's God Almighty. Let's bring him in. Hallelujah. Welcome to liberty. This is not a disagreement among friends. This is the elect being deceived. I pray for Ron Rhodes. I pray for Mark Hitchcock. I pray the Lord will show them that they are misguided and they are misleading others. And I pray that if there's something I am getting wrong or those with views akin to my own, that the Lord will correct us. The times are serious. If possible, the elect will be deceived. The enemy, at this point in history, at this point in time, the enemy concerning Antichrist is doing everything he can in desperation to deceive the elect. May the Lord have mercy. My name is James Jacob Prash, coming to you on Word for the Weekend on RTN Christian TV Scotland and Moriel TV. 
Thank you so much for joining us. May God bless you. Have a good weekend. A couple of questions uh, as we switch hats here. A couple of questions on the Antichrist. Will Christians be able to identify the Antichrist before the rapture? No. I don't think so. I don't think so. I don't think any of us do. I think Second yeah. Thessalonians 2 pretty much settles that yeah. because, you know, some of the uh, Thessalonians were worried that they might be already in the tribulation or the day of the Lord. And, uh, you know, Paul writes them and he says, I don't know, you know, who told you this, but... You know, the Antichrist has to be on the scene when you're in the day of the Lord. And if you're not seeing the Antichrist yet, you're not in the day of the Lord. And so Paul made that point to them. Now, if you know who the Antichrist is, I, I always tell people tongue in cheek that you've been left behind. <laughs> it says in that passage, clearly, the restrainer has to be removed first. And uh, if the restrainer is indeed the Holy Spirit empowering the church and the church goes out in the rapture, the rapture has to take place before the Antichrist can be revealed. Uh, a lot of people misread that passage. Uh, 2 Thessalonians 2 is a very important passage about the timing of when the Antichrist himself will be revealed. Uh, the scripture actually uses the same word apocalypse there uh, that it does for the revelation of Jesus Christ. You'll have a revelation of the Antichrist, but only after the restrainer's been removed. Yeah, the, the Bible tells us there, I think, in that passage that, you know, he's being, uh, he's being restrained, that, that Satan can't bring his man on the scene right now. The Holy Spirit's restraining him. But I think that's interesting because that means, I believe, that Satan probably has someone ready in every generation to be the Antichrist. There's always an Antichrist that's alive somewhere on the earth. And, but, but that person will only be revealed as the Antichrist after the rapture takes place. So trying to figure out, you know, if someone's name equals 666 or all those kind of things, to me that's jumping the gun. Uh, <coughs> that's working ahead of time. Uh, we have to wait. Whenever the rapture takes place, those who are on earth then who come to faith in the Lord, they'll be able to calculate and determine who the Antichrist is. And one of the reasons why that's necessary, John, is that Satan is not omniscient. He doesn't know omnisciently the exact timing of the unfolding of prophetic events. And so therefore it is necessary for him to have a man waiting in the wings in every generation. Yeah, so it shouldn't surprise us there was a Hitler and a Stalin and people like that who could have easily become that person, uh, but weren't. Satan has to read the Bible, read the newspaper. He's brilliant and intelligent, but he is not God and he does not have omniscience. He doesn't even know the timing of the rapture. Uh, and so he has to wait. His hands are tied by the sovereignty of God. Only when the trumpet sounds and the archangel shouts and the bride of Christ is taken out, only then will he be free to indwell and empower someone to be the Antichrist. can keep God from keeping his covenant with me. I'm not in covenant with a person. I'm not in covenant with a political party. I'm in covenant with God Almighty. I am God Almighty. Get that off you. That's not your name. That's not your station. That's not your end. It's in me. It's in me. It's in me. It is God that worketh in you.
Absolutely. Second question, okay? We've done this series on Revelation, and you fellows have talked about the rapture could happen any moment. People want to know, how do you know that it could happen any moment, and what's this word mean that you've used a couple times called imminent? Where do you have a Bible basis for talking about the rapture could happen at any time? Well, in Paul's letter to the Corinthians, he talks about this and says, in a moment, in a flash, in a twinkling of an eye. So something related to the coming of Christ has to happen quickly, suddenly, instantly. And throughout the book of Revelation, seven times you have that phrase, I'll come quickly, I'll come quickly. It's as though he comes and snatches away the church, and that could potentially happen at any moment. Well, when we use the word imminent, we're not meaning that it's immediate necessarily. What we're saying is there's nothing else that has to happen before the rapture takes place. So uh, the rapture is an event that is certain to take place, but it's uncertain when it will happen. It, uh, it's kind of like uh, the big one that everyone's waiting for out in California, you know, this big earthquake that's going to come. Everybody knows it's coming, but no one knows when it's going to happen. So it's an imminent event. It's an event that can take place at any time. And this is really borne out in the scriptures in 1 Thessalonians 1, 9 and 10. Uh, Paul is writing to the church at Thessalonica. And he says, You turned uh, to God from idols to serve the living and true God and to wait for His Son from heaven who delivers us uh, from the wrath to come. And uh, the, the word that's used there, to wait, literally means to wait up for. Uh, we're to wait up for His Son from heaven. And if you're waiting up for someone, then the idea is that they could come at any point in time. And it says there too that He's coming to deliver us from this coming wrath, from this time of wrath that's coming in the tribulation. So this also supports the idea that His coming will be before uh, this time of wrath that's coming on the earth. Yeah. I think also um, in Revelation 3.10, it talks about how the church will be delivered from the hour of trial that is to come. I want you to understand that it's the time period that we are to be delivered from, not just tribulation. It's not as if God is going to sustain us through a period of tribulation, but rather the church will be kept out of the period of tri tribulation. It's the Greek word ek, which means out of. So the church will be kept out of the period of tribulation. And John, this is distinct from general tribulation. All of us as Christians experience general tribulation. Life is tough sometimes, but that's distinct from this period of tribulation that's coming on the earth. And all the verses that deal with the rapture talk about how we're going to be delivered from that time before it even begins.
Thank、you